you do a Google search for um, expat health insurance, international health insurance, the number one ranking has the worst policy wording. But people buy this policy; they don't know that it it has lousy policy wording, and they it's it's like a it's like a ticking time bomb embedded in your policy, waiting to go off. So you can imagine yourself in her shoes or in her hospital bed at her most vulnerable. And I think in bad faith, the insurer denied the claim. But strictly speaking, they were abiding by the contract. You can buy good policies and they don't cost more with good wording, good underwriter, full legal recourse, and even with consumer protection. This is Dan of Vagabond Awake. And today we're lucky to have someone on the channel, Alex from uh, worldexpathealth.com. And Alex is an ins a health insurance expert and also salesman. And I decided to interview him so you guys could find out some of the pros and cons and what to look for in insurance policies. Um, Alex, welcome. Many experts I know personally speak very highly of your character. And for that reason, I've invited you on my channel to answer expat insurance questions. Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Well, thank you for that. Uh, you're welcome. I'm ready. Oh, good. So, uh, Alex, what's the difference between travel insurance and medical insurance with respect to accidents, emergencies, and diagnosed medical problems that need treatment? All right. So the easiest way to explain this is to uh, identify the types of treatment. Um, you, I, I generally put them into four categories. So there's accidents and emergencies. Uh, then there's urgent medical treatment and elective medical. So think of you are um, uh, uh, on a long trip and you have travel insurance and you have a cancer diagnosis. Well, your travel insurer is going to tell you to go home and get that treated. Now, it's not going to affect your out outcome if you take a couple of weeks to um, wind up your affairs and return home, but that's what your travel insurance, travel insurance expects, expects you to do. So elective medical treatment, uh, they're not going to do a hip replacement. They're going to expect you to go home for that. The most common type of surgery is inguinal hernia surgery. You can have a hernia for years. So um, they're, once again, going to expect you to, to go home for that. And so the underlying assumption behind travel insurance is that you have medical insurance at home to return to if you have an urgent or elective medical treatment issue. Um, uh, and the other issue is even if you did have a, an accident, um, travel insurance is not renewable. It's only extendable at the option of the insurer. So uh, the difference is health insurance, medical insurance is guaranteed to be renewable at your option. It can't refuse you. So that's, that's the key difference. And, and with international medical insurance, you never need to buy travel insurance. Uh, you can travel to or from any country for medical treatment, even back home to the United States. That option is a little bit more expensive. But it's full company. That's that's the key difference. Um, and since you're in Malaysia, I was um, in a uh, <clears throat> I was watching a video from the Nomad Capitalist. Do you know him? He's based in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. He did a video on health insurance, and he's usually pretty good. But there's one thing he didn't figure um, with respect to travel and health insurance and being a long-term expat. So his plan was to have um, health insurance, domestic admitted health insurance in Malaysia. And whenever he was outside of Malaysia, he would buy travel insurance. So the, my question for him is, if you had cancer or if you had a major medical issue and you claimed in Malaysia, that's fine. But then what happens later if you wish to move to another country? You are a nomad capitalist after all. So if you have developed that pre-existing condition, then you, that, that may basically um, prevent you from moving to that other country, from being the nomad, because you're stuck there with that insurer there, because you can't get insurance anywhere else because you now have that pre-existing condition. So should people look only for insurance in countries with well-regulated insurance laws and agencies? And if so, what countries would those be? Well, these days I only sell um, <clears throat> policies from the UK, um, and I'll tell you why. It's the best legal domicile for this type of, of product in the English speaking world. Um, there's about 10 different products there. Um, they have the most serious underwriter, sorry, the most serious regulator called the Financial Conduct Authority. Now, five years ago, it was called the Financial Services Authority. And there were some shenanigans going on there in the UK investment space. 
um, and consumers were burned. And they sorted out that mess. But in so doing so, they wanted to change the focus of their um, of their activity. And that was good conduct. Good conduct should be the watchword amongst all players in the UK financial space. So they changed their name to the Financial Conduct Authority. They're very serious. They just won't tolerate bad policy wording. The third thing is, and it's unique to this domicile, is consumer protection. They have the UK government office of, called the UK Insurance Ombudsman's Office. Anybody, any nationality that has a British expat policy, if they have a claim dispute, in the extremely unlikely event, they can take their claim dispute to the UK Insurance Ombudsman's Office, who will examine it for free. And if they think you're in the right, they'll just order the insurer to pay. There's no suing. There's no, there's, it's, it's just great protection for the consumer. Those and the, the good words. news is you don't have to pay extra for that. Um, so when you talk about expat insurance, we'll get to this later in detail, but you're talking about no matter where someone is in the world, if they're an expat, they can get an insurance policy that's governed by British law. Is that what I'm understanding? If they buy a British policy, correct. Right. And that is the gold standard, it sounds like. Uh, for... In my opinion, um, there's, there's policies from the USA, um, but um, there's 50 different domiciles for uh, health insurance in the USA, because um, that's governed by the states uh, at that regulatory level. And all of the American insurers tend to gravitate to the uh, place that has the lightest hand of regulation. Uh, you also mentioned in your ebook that the financial stability of an insurance company uh, rests on the stability of the underwriter company. Is there a way on the internet for people to determine whether or not the underwriter for their insurance company has an A rating? Yes, um, but first of all, in brochures, usually the uh, insurer will highlight the fact that they have a great underwriter and that it has a great rating from a rating agency, right? So if you don't see that front and center, that's a warning sign. So the, the big rating agencies are Standard & Poor's, AM Best. Uh, so if you go to their websites, you can clearly see which which underwriter, uh, what, the, what the what the rating is. It, that, that's an easy one. Um, your ebook also mentions that there are allegedly um, insurance companies that will take your money and reject your claims. Is there a red flag that you might see with such insurance companies uh, to help people see that without me us going through a list of companies? Well, you're you're referring to the appendix when I'm when I'm talking about one particular uh, insurer um, right. that is um, that is based out of Hong Kong. Okay. Now the danger signals are if they ask no questions on their application form other than your credit card information. So they're not even asking height or weight. The other danger signals would be if um, if they're if they have no regulator, they have no underwriter, um, and they're domiciled in a in a in a dodgy place. You also mentioned in your ebook. Uh, by the way, people will will give you a link to his ebook. You can get it and read about this stuff. But to get a free copy of Alex's ebook teaching how to identify expat health insurance with consumer protections, click the link above right now. Um, good policy language versus bad. Um, you give some examples in there. What can you go over those briefly? What to look for in terms of policy language? Well, in the ebook, I talk about the most important section of any policy wording, and that is the uh, section on pre existing conditions. So we have to talk about that as a preamble for a second. Like car insurance, you have to buy the car insurance before you have the car accident. Similarly, uh, medical insurers, health insurers are not going to insure obvious pre existing conditions you had before you bought the policy. Medical insurance policy wordings have an exclusion on pre-existing conditions, all of them, the good ones and the bad ones and the ugly ones. So the key thing is what comes after that exclusion, and it's what I call the qualifier. Now, the qualifier says, accept those conditions which you could not have been reasonably aware of. So let me read the whole thing. The bad policies will have pre-existing conditions, undisclosed, undeclared, otherwise, are excluded. The good ones additionally will have, except those that you could not have been reasonably aware of. So the, the classic case is um, bowel cancer uh, case study I did in the ebook, where three years after the lady bought her policy, um, she was diagnosed with bowel cancer and she made the claim, thinking, I've been paying for three years, this will be covered, right? And wrong, because 
she got a letter from her um, from her insurer saying, well, we've done a reverse extrapolation on this tumor size. And with medical certainty, we have determined that you had it more than three years ago before you bought the policy. Therefore, eh, it's not it's, it's excluded. It's not covered. Claim denied. Right. So you can imagine yourself in her shoes or in her hospital bed at her most vulnerable, you know, having this terrible news that she's not covered. I and mean, she did all the right things and paid the premium. So if she had had the good policy wording, except those conditions which you could not have been reasonably aware of, and she was asymptomatic for this uh, bowel cancer, as everybody is. Um, and she could have no way of knowing it ahead of time, you know, when it was just a few cells in size more than three years prior. Um, and I think in bad faith, the insurer denied the claim. But strictly speaking, they were abiding by the contract. So the good policy wordings have the exclusion and the qualifying. The bad policy wordings have just the exclusion, right? The ugly policy wordings have the exclusion and the disqualifier, which says we will not cover unknown conditions. And if you look at the, um, if you do a Google search for um, for uh, expat health insurance, international health insurance, the number one ranking has the worst policy word, has the disqualifier. But people buy this policy, they don't know that it it has lousy policy wording and they, it's it's like a it's like a ticking time bomb embedded in your policy, waiting to go off on you, like it did on that lady, um, uh, in 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 that Hong Kong hospital bed. And the key thing about bowel cancer is, the three percent of people in the world have bowel cancer at any one time, but half of them don't know. They only know it later until they've had a colonoscopy. So, but on the under fifty almost never have bowel cancer. So this. 3% of the population is all in the 50 and above. So really maybe 6% of those people have, of, of age 50 and above have bowel cancer and half of them don't know it. So the, the actuaries of insurers know this and they're looking to exclude these conditions and increase their profits by having lousy policy winning. The good news is if you're aware of this, you can buy health insurance policies with good policy wording and it doesn't cost extra. You just have to be aware of this. Um, potential bomb embedded in, uh, in, in in your policy word. And it's all, the, the most important thing to look at is the exclusions on pre-existing conditions. So the the ombudsman you mentioned in the UK, um, is this something they police or or would they, will they only hold the, insure, the insurance company to the wording that's in the contract? Well, they all have good wording, so you don't have to worry about that. So... The, the the regulator doesn't tolerate bad, bad policy. Nice, beautiful answer. So what should people look for in the policy that will allow them to sue the insurance company rather than be forced into arbitration? And how is the government insurance a bit a UK better? UK insurance for, ombudsman? Yes. And why is, how is it better? There are about four policies on the market, and they're all American, that have mandatory um, arbitration clauses in the contract. So you can't sue them. You have to go through some nonsense arbitration procedure, uh, usually in some place where you're not, like New York um, uh, or wherever. And you have to pay these arbitrators $600 an hour. And what are they going to arbitrate? Really, there, there, there's nothing to arbitrate. And if you try to sue the insurer, they're going to send their lawyer to court and just say, well, we have apply for a, a, mo a, motion, a, motion, a motion to compel arbitration, and the judge is going to grant it because it's in the contract. So... You don't want, you, you want a judge deciding whether your claim is going to be denied or not. You don't want to go through this nonsense. Or they, they do this deliberately so that they don't have to uh, pay claims. Expats often talk of getting dropped from insurance at age 70, 75 or whatever. Is there a way to make sure you can get insurance after that age? And if so, what should they look for to make sure that happens? Well, there's, there's three different issues here. There's only one type of policy. And again, it's that one with the bad policy wording, the cohort policy, which has which drops you at age 75 unless you've had continuous cover. Um, and then they will continue on past 75 in a very low level reduced benefit policy. But rea the reality is that the structure of their policy means that you'll never have 10 years of continuous cover prior to age 75 and you'll never qualify for them. So you'll be dropped. <laughs> it's 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 a trick. 
Um, all of British insurers and many American ones too will allow you to continue past the, uh, the the deadline, the age limit deadline for applications. So those age limit deadlines, depending on the company, are 64, 69, and 74. There are two or three companies which will allow you to, to apply age 75 and beyond. And on very few um, opportunities for people that age. Um, but what you want to be, and they will all let you continue to renew. But one thing that came up last year was a company that I knew uh, accepted applications to 874, but they didn't publish their renewal premiums beyond 874. And last year, for the first time, they did. And boy, I just was in the state of apoplexy. What? It's going to double after. It's going to be a fifteen thousand dollar bill. It's going to go from like six thousand to fifteen thousand, from seventy four to seventy five. So um, when I found that out, I immediately switched uh, clients over to um, uh, another policy, which publishes premium premiums to actually age one hundred, and they're they're quite reasonable um, to age one hundred for those ages. So you wow. you you have to know. Um, you have to look at the premium tables. You have to ask questions. You have to you have to find out if you can continue to renew beyond eight seventy five, and all of them do, except for those 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 bad actors with those uh, uh, tricky questions. In your tricky in your in your ebook, you mentioned the difference between pre authorization and pre certification, and what you should be careful of um, when you're being treated. Can you go over that briefly for people? Well, pre-authorization is a procedure whereby um, if you know you have you, you need surgery or you have a, a medical event which is coming and needs treatment, the first thing you do is you call the insurer, and all insurers require you to do this. You tell them about your issue. Um, they uh, tell you whether it's covered or not, and then they uh, pre-authorize the claim. That means you can go to the hospital, and they've already told you they will pay for it. Um, you, you should do other things as well, like tell tell them the hospital you're going to and the contact person there and the doctor and, and let them call to make arrangements for you to go there and so that the insurer can pay that hospital directly. But with some companies, they have a different um, and, and that pre-authorization is a one stop shopping um, procedure. Once you have that, you know, you're clear. Um, with pre-certification. Um, it's much more complicated, and it's and it's not clear uh, from the insurer exactly uh, what what the procedure is and what you have to do, and they don't tell you, and agents don't know either. So pre-certification, you're supposed to call them and get the uh, procedure pre-certified, but what that means is only to pre-certify the medical necessity of the claim. Well, yes, you've got cancer, and yes, you need treatment, right? Take the lady in the Hong Kong hospital. She pre-certified it. Yes, you have cancer. Um, but the next stage you have to do, which they don't tell you, is verify the benefits, which means, which is like pre-authorization, which means you're going to pay. So uh, you have to insist on getting the, ver the benefits verified after the pre-certification because you don't know if they're going to pay or not. Um, and so it's happened in hospitals when people have been pre-certified and then they go to the hospital, and then their claim has been denied. But as I said in the ebook, you know, the the executive of this insurer said, "Yeah, well, how could you possibly go into hospital without verifying the benefits?" Well, it, it's fine, you know, to, to to say that. But if you don't know, you have to verify the benefits, and you think pre-certification is a green light, and nobody tells you, then it's it's just absurd. Right. So only Americans, Amer pre-certification is an American phenomenon. And again, that um, number one um, insurer on the Google list has pre-certification as a requirement. Okay. Um, you're, so you're, you're, um, you're, you're, you're sensing, you're smiling, and you're sensing a direction. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, America is is not a place where consumers are well protected, and I see it over and over again as I travel around the world. It's nice to hear Britain's uh, a little more friendly in that regard. Um, so um, what countries uh, do you offer policies for people living outside their home country? And in other words, is it where they're from that matters or where they're traveling to? How does that work? Where they're living that matters. Um, 
I, I, I offer policies uh, in all countries in the world, all right? But um, most insurers will not cover expats in the USA. So I have my two or three favorite providers for everybody that's living outside the USA. Um, and I have one provider who I use for um, foreign, foreign expats that are living in the USA. Okay. Um, so are you an agent for just one company now, or do you offer policies from various companies? And if I'm, multiple... I'm an, agent for, I'm an agent for four or five companies, the companies I like. Um, and I don't, I don't need to, to broaden that. Essentially, you know, my, my market is, um, is people from the English speaking world. So the, the companies that cater to the English speaking world are based in Hong Kong, United States and the UK. Um, there are other insurers in other places like Luxembourg, um, uh, uh, or France, but you know, the reality is French people will always buy from AXA. And German people will always buy from Allianz. Um, and um, I don't have, you know, I've got lots of Swiss customers because there's no expat insurer um, in, in Switzerland, apparently. So um, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Um, so next up, um, I you asked me to give you my name and uh, or my uh, age and whatnot and, and the fact that I have no pre-existing conditions, and you quoted a policy amount, which I'll uh, explain now. I got a quote from you of, I'm 63, um, and with a $2,500 annual deductible, the annual premium would be $2,400 or $215 a month. My first question is, so I decide I'm, I need to go see a doctor. Do I call the insurance company when I get sick, or do I just go to a doctor What's how does that part of it work? Well, let me explain. Um, <clears throat> all of these policies have benefit levels. Um, typically, the three benefit levels, as, as I explained in my book, are hospital cover only, uh, then outpatient, and then an executive type plan. So, the type of policy that almost all expats, especially older expats, buy is they buy a hospital only. Why do they do that? They do that because, well, if they're retired, they might be financially constrained. Uh, so they want the least expensive policy. Um, but the, the key reason is in places like Malaysia, the Dominican Republic where I live and Mexico where many, many expats live, outpatient treatment and outpatient specialist consultations are dirt cheap. It's not gonna cost you more than $100. So you, you pay for that yourself. You self-insure for that. And you cover yourself for the big hits, the big hospital hits. And why do you take a biggish deductible with a hospital plan? Well, because hospitalization is a rare event in anybody's life. And, um, you know, I, I've been to the hospital once in the last 20 years. So if I was continuously covered uh, for that 20 years, I would have paid the $2,500 deductible once. And the amount I would have saved in the premiums over that 20 years would have been huge. Exactly. That's my reason. So, so that's too. that's the sweet spot. With that particular policy that I mentioned to you, that's that's a bit unusual because the twenty five hundred dollar deductible is what most people take. And to go from twenty five hundred to five thousand, there's only a five percent difference. And to go to the next stage down seventy five hundred, there's another only another five percent difference. So people usually take the twenty five hundred dollar deductible with that one. And that's an annual deductible. That means once you've once your medical expenses exceed that twenty five hundred dollars, you get a hundred percent recovery right up to the million dollars sum insured of the policy, and that's a million dollars per year, not a million dollars lifetime. So you get a right. million dollars this year, and you get a million dollars next year. And most of the countries that I spend time in, a million dollars will cover more oh, yeah. than ninety nine percent of the things that could go wrong. Um, so, and and you mentioned a million, so that would cover me a million each year, renews every year, and I only pay the deductible once. That's great. So, so now I'm now I'm sick, or I want to go see a doctor. Do I call the hospital? Do I call the insurance company? How does well, that part of it work? With a hospital plan, um, if you need to go see the doctor, if you know you need to see a hospital hospitalization, or you know you need a hospitalization event, the first thing you do is you call the assistance department of the insurer. And they're going to ask you for more information, and you go for that pre-authorization uh, procedure. 
All right. So uh, most of the hospital plans include a small amount of outpatient or pre-hospital expenses, outpatient expenses, and post-hospital outpatient expenses. So um, you've got a budget for that uh, for the hospitalization. Um, so for those outpatient expenses, you might pay for that yourself and get reimbursed. Um, but for the actual hospitalization, I think the insurer would try uh, its utmost to pay directly, directly settle with the hospital. And that was what my next question was. I've heard stories where people actually have an insurance policy. They're actually covered, but they need to come up with a large amount of money to get into the hospital to be taken care of out of their own pocket. And later they'll be reimbursed. How does that work with this plan? It's, it's country specific. Okay. So um, there are what I call rape hospitals in the world which will um, demand a huge upfront deposit. Um, and it's, it's, it's not the case everywhere, but um, the key thing is to, is to talk with your insurer beforehand and as much as possible. We're, we're assuming it's not you know, accidental trauma and you haven't been taken to the, ambulance, to the hospital in an ambulance. Uh, let them make the arrangements, let them handle things. And, um, you know, if if it was the case where you were that you were being taken to a hospital directly in an ambulance, you're going to hopefully tell them you have insurance. But they might there might be an issue there where you have to put up some money or or a credit card card. And that's um, going to be country specific. Um, kind of a side question. So if I'm in a country that has these hospitals that want a large deposit, um, the insurance covers in this case the insurance covers me worldwide. I could just fly to a country that is more friendly is that true for coverage that's correct you can travel to or from any country you wish within your geographical area of cover uh, for treatment so if you want to go to the best hospital in switzerland get on the airplane and go so people do that let's say when they have a rare form of cancer and there might be a center of excellence in that hospital in switzerland for that particular type of cancer so you can get on the airplane and go you, meant, you mentioned in your, uh, I forget the word you use, but in the domain of care, you've in the past you said U.S. is not included, which I'm okay with, uh, but Switzerland is. So that that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. So you're talking about with a million bucks, depending on what the problem is uh, for that year at least, um, you can go anywhere in the world that's, for, you know, most of the, uh, like where, where couldn't I go other than the U.S.? Okay, so the, the structure of plans are usually um, – there's two premium rates, one for worldwide cover, including the USA. And many Americans are, are wedded to the fact that they want to return to the USA for medical treatment. So um, in a partic particular policy that um, uh, I sent to you, um, you could pay about twice as much to have worldwide cover, and you would allow to be able to go to the USA for treatment, and you could spend 180 days per year in the USA. Limit. But if you paid the half the amount and, and bought the geographical cover worldwide, excluding USA, right. the world's your oyster. Go anywhere you want. So what happens when I'm 75, 85, 90? Are, are they required? I've asked this before, but they're, they can, they are required to keep writing this for me? It's as, just long the as, price. as long as the program continues to exist, they're required to renew you. Okay. The only way they could fail to renew you is if they ended the whole program. Okay. They can't that discriminate for, against you. Okay, and that's could they end the whole program for just some ages, or does that mean in the whole program for everybody in the world? They close it down. They shut it down. Okay. okay. Um, and are, are there caps on increases? There's there's no caps on increases, but um, what the, the the caps on increases are the competitors of premiums, right? If one company, you know, Cigna, if, if they, if, if you got a quotation from Cigna, you would be talking three times what I quoted you. But they're very expensive. Um, but they don't care. Um, or it seems they don't care to, to compete with, with companies like the one I sent you. So these companies compete with each other, and that that's what keeps premiums low. That's the, okay. the, the constraint on... on uh, Something you said earlier was interesting when you talked about the the nomad capitalist if he had if he had one of your policies in malaysia for example 
uh, or he had one of your international policies, let's put it that way, instead of a Malaysian policy, no matter where he went, he wouldn't have been able to continue the policy and, and he wouldn't have been trying to go get a new policy somewhere after he'd been diagnosed with some condition and therefore he wouldn't have a pre-existing condition. He well, would just have a the, continuous the policy. The nomad capitalists, let's say Malaysia, for whatever reason, no longer becomes a, uh, a safe harbor for guys like him anymore, right? Right. He might want to move to a new country. He doesn't know that capitalism. So the problem is he's he's tied to Malaysian domestic uh, admitted insurance health. So he has right? so he has to fly back there to get treatment. Right? No, he, he 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 buys travel insurance, or so he said in his video. When he leaves Malaysia, yeah, he buy that for months at a time. But it's only accident and emergency cover, as I said. Yeah. What if he gets cancer? Well, the travel insurance is going to say go back to wherever you have health insurance and get that treated. Okay. Right, right, yeah. So he has some medical event which causes a problem for him as a pre-existing condition. And then Malaysia, for whatever reason, becomes no longer a safe harbor. He doesn't like that place. He wants to leave, right? He's got that pre-existing condition. He may not be able to get health insurance in the new place that he wants to go to. Exactly. Because if you've got the international health insurance now, no matter what pre-existing condition he has, he has a guaranteed right to renew. And it's portable. Portable. And he never needs to buy travel yeah, insurance. Portable. Right? That concept is the gold standard because we have what I, you know, I call uh, stationary people. They just go to one country, retire there, and live happily ever after until something Agreed. happens. If, if, if that's what they're committed to, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe local health insurance is a better deal for them, right? Right. Maybe. And if they're American, I have a travel insurance policy, which they can buy which will allow them to go back to the USA for the for the couple of months or weeks that they want to go to just just for that eventuality and right. they go back to their country of expectation expatriation where they have local health insurance right but it, it, it depends on um, that that's also an addict. if if he's happy with that and he's never ever going to leave malaysia that's fine right but the idea of him being a nomad capitalist you know wandering the world um, and being international, there's there's a flaw there, potential flaw there uh, in the future, um, if that country ever becomes uh, a, a problem, no longer as friendly as it is now. That's but the, the, call... the, the international solution is better because you can go anywhere you want. You don't have to go back home, right? There's no yes. home to go back to with the international policy. And you have the option of going to to studying the market and figuring out, in the case example you use, Switzerland or maybe India for some cancers or, you know, the best doctor for that thing in the world might be in an expensive country. It might be in an inexpensive country. Right. Uh, and you have that choice because you have this international coverage um, that will cover you. And so that's, that's, and the second kind of subscriber I have is what I call slow travelers and they do what I do. They just travel around the world, but no, I'm a nomad, but you know, I've spent a few months or up to a year in a country and then, I go somewhere else. Um, you, you you get to know it and, and get a feel for it. Right. And so for me, it's an ideal uh, concept. I knew that lady in Hong Kong that had that thing. And I, I wanted to know why she had that problem. And I saw the letter from the insurer with reasonable medical certainty. You had this policy. You had this condition before the three more than three years ago. We understand you were asymptomatic for it. We understand that um, you could not have been aware of it. But that doesn't matter. <clears throat> We're still declining the claim. I thought, that's really shitty. That's really unfair. And uh, that's ugly policy wording. And I know exactly what she said when she read that letter. She went, ah, wah, wah, wah. It was an ugly, ugly thing. You know, it was really ugly. And I vowed that if I was going to continue in this business, that was never going to happen again. So I have a collection. Uh, I have a Word document where I pulled out the pre-existing condition wording, all of these different companies. And I, 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 I read them. Pass, fail, not able to determine. So uh, um, I only sell the, the good ones. The good news is for people that are buying this, they don't have to pay more for the good ones, right? Yeah, that's oh, in your ebook. You talk about that. Yeah, that's a great URL. So I went to that website and um, I looked. I thought, what are they selling? And they had nine different insurers. And they actually had a little chat window. And I was starting to chat with um, somebody there. In my opinion, seven of these nine insurers they represented were fails. Seven of them were fails because they had bad policy wording. Four of them were fails because had two strikes against them because you couldn't sue them. You had no legal recourse in the event of a claim dispute. One actually had 
uh, an underwriter with a junk credit rating. Yeah. And one had a dodgy domicile, Turks and Caicos. Um, but he had no clue that any of these nine would have failure points. Of the seven fails, there were two passes. And the seven fails all had one thing in common, and the two passes had the opposite thing in common. And the seven fails were all American products. The two passes were not American products. You can buy good policies, and they don't cost more with good wording, good underwriter, full legal recourse, and even with consumer protection. Well, Alex, thanks so much for your time. It's It's been uh, very informative. I know nothing about health insurance, but many expats that have bought medical insurance from Alex say he's honest. Many of you asked me about where to buy health insurance, uh, so I decided to interview Alex. I read his ebook that teaches how to spot a good health insurance policy from a bad one. He's not paying me for this interview and he's not paying me if you buy health insurance from him. I have not independently verified anything that Alex teaches in this video. So conduct your own due diligence before making any purchases from anyone. Hopefully this interview will help you decide what questions you need to ask as you conduct your research. I ended up buying the insurance policy Alex discusses in this video. And his ebook is available at the end of this video. Just click the little icon that says free ebook.